Okay, good morning, everyone. So uh, today we are happy to have Bernard Keller from University of Paris 7, or Paris, uh, University of Paris Diderot. And he will tell us about the Tate Hochschild cohomology, the singularity, and applications. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to talk at this seminar. Let me share my screen. Okay, so it will be uh, mostly a blackboard talk. At the end, when I run out of time, it may become a slides talk. Um, so, well, the title, Tate Hochschild cohomology, the singularity category and applications. And the plan, just a moment, I have some problem here. everything on the screen. The plan is as follows. I will start with a reminder on Hochschild cohomology. Then I will introduce oh. Tate Hochschild cohomology. Professor Keller, I, I don't think yes. we see new uh, oh. new writings. Oh, good, good. Well, just, it takes some time. It, it just, oh, sorry. <laughs> it, yeah, now we see it. Yeah. Okay. Then I will introduce Tate Hochschild cohomology. And state the main theorem. And finally, I will come to the applications. And these will be reconstruction theorems for singularities. True reconstruction theorems. And this last part is joint work with Zheng Hua from Hong Kong University. And uh, here you have a picture of the thing. Okay, so let's start with Hochschild cohomology. And uh, I will follow the historical development of the subject. So if you like, it will be Hochschild cohomology by its history. Okay, let's fix a ground field K. Everything can be done over a commutative ring, but for simplicity, let's work over the field. And then let's fix A, a K algebra. And by this, I will always mean an associative algebra with a unit element but usually non-commutative. Okay, and then Hochschild cohomology of A was defined by Gerhard Hochschild. In 1945, and he defines it as the cohomology of the Hochschild co-chain complex. So let me recall this complex. Sorry. Okay, what does it look like? C A A. 
it has a in degree zero, then k linear maps from a to a in degree one, k linear maps from a tensor a to a in degree two, etc. And then in degree p, k linear maps from the pth tensor power of a to a. Okay, and let me write down the first two differentials. The first differential takes little a to the commutator with little a, and the second differential takes a linear map d to the linear map taking a tensor b to dA times b minus d of ab plus a times db. And you can find the higher differentials in all the references on the subject or you can guess them for yourselves. And uh, so we see immediately that in degree zero, we get the center of A, denoted by ZA, and clearly that's a commutative algebra. And in degree one, well, as you can see, what do we do? We take, we take the kernel, that's the derivations, modulo the image, that's the inner derivations. So what we get is outer derivations from A to itself, and that is, of course, a Lie algebra. Now, both of these structures actually extend to the whole Hochschild um, do the whole of Hochschild cohomology. Let's first remember how this works for the commutative product. For this, let me introduce the enveloping algebra A tensor A opposite. And then but modules over this algebra are bimodules over A. So in particular, we have the algebra itself, which we call the, the identity bimodule or the diagonal bimodule identity by module because tensoring with A uh, over A gives us uh, the identity factor. And then Carton Eilenberg in their book in 1956 reinterpreted Hochschild cohomology as the Yoneda algebra of the identity by model as a by model. Okay, and then this clearly becomes an algebra. And the product is called in this case cup product and denoted by a little cup. Now, surprisingly, it took seven more years for people to realize that it's actually a commutative algebra. This was shown by Kirsten Harbour in 1963, namely, so he showed several things. First of all, he showed that Hochschild cohomology is graded commutative as an algebra. Now, a, a modern argument might go like, like this. Well, you, you just observe that the identity by module is the unit object in a triangulated monoidal category. Namely, the derived category of bimodules together with the monoidal product given by tensoring over A. Okay, and then by the Ekman-Hilton argument, the uh, endomorphism algebra of a unit in a monoidal category is commutative. Okay, now this is not uh, Gerson Haber's argument. Gerson Haber's argument is a direct computation at the level of code chains. And in examining the failure 
of the cup product to be commutative at the co-chain level, he introduced a new operation on Hochschild cohomology, namely he discovered a, a bracket on Hochschild cohomology shifted by one degree. So this was his second discovery. It's a graded Lie algebra. And the bracket is nowadays called the Gassenhaber bracket. Okay. Now it's it's important to lift these operations, the uh, commutative product, well, and the Gassenhaber bracket to the co-chain level. And what you get when you do that is part of a much richer structure, which was axiomatized by Gensler and Jones in 1994. Namely, they showed that if you take the Hofschild co-chain complex itself, endowed with the natural lift of the cup product to the co-chain level and the so-called brace operations, what you get is what they called a B infinity algebra. Okay, so you might wonder where the letter B comes from. Maybe B infinity because it's after A infinity, but that's not the historical reason. The historical reason is that B stands for the first, the initial of Bowes, the German topologist Hans Joachim Bowes, who showed in 1981 that if you take singular code chains, say with integer coefficients on an arbitrary topological space, then you get a B infinity algebra for any topological space X. So we see that in both cases, the, the presence of the B infinity structure is strongly related to the presence of a monoidal structure. In, in the case of uh, the Hochschild cohomology, it's this monoidal structure. In the case of singular cohomology, it's the monoidal structure on the derived category of sheaves of the Boolean groups on our topological space. <clears throat> okay, and I should... Uh, define the brace operations. Okay, as first studied by Kadeshvili in 88. Okay, well, we suppose we have a bunch of code chains U, V, up to W. And we want to find, define the brace operation with another code chain C. What do we do? Well, let's say C is a P code chain. Then we view C as an operation with P entries and one output. Okay. And now we plug the other code chains U, V, up to W into some of the inputs. W. Then we plug identities onto all the other inputs. Uh, then we add, we throw in suitable signs and we take the sum over all possibilities of doing this. And that is the definition of the brace operation. And so this brace operation together with the cup product and the differential contains the whole information. So the B infinity structure contains the whole information. All the information. For example, if you want to reconstruct the bracket of a code chain C with a code chain U, you just form C brace U graded commutator U brace C. So this is the Gustenhaber bracket is definitely 
contained in the V infinity structure. Okay. Okay, let me go on. Yes. So the second remark is on a generalization, namely, it's clear that these constructions generalize from K algebras to K categories. Well, we should, well, what is a K category? It's simply a K algebra with several objects. In the spirit of a famous article by Mitchell in 1972, if I remember correctly, yes. And they further generalize to differential graded or DG categories. And this generalization is, is important because of deformation theory. In deformation theory, especially in the non-commutative setting, we want to deform not just algebras, but categories and also triangulated categories, which you model using DG categories. And so it becomes important to determine uh, Hochschild cohomology of suitable DG categories. And here is a very nice theorem which does that. And it's due to independently to Bertrand Touraine and to Van de Loven and Michel Vandenberg from 2005. So it tells us uh, how to compare Hochschild cohomology of A with Hochschild cohomology of the category of all A modules. Now this is an abelian category. So we take, we have to do a suitable modification. And then as an abelian category by definition, this is the Hochschild cohomology of the K category of all injective A models. And then we have a natural morphism in this direction and it's an isomorphism. Okay, and we can go further. We can compare this with the Hochschild cohomology of the derived category, or precisely the canonical DG enhancement of the derived category. And again, we get an isomorphism. And these isomorphisms, well, they exist not just at the level of cohomology, they lift to the B infinity level, which is of course important again, because of applications in deformation theory. These isomorphisms lift to the B infinity level as a consequence of a result from 2000. Three, and I should uh, explain the notation. Well, so mod A, capital mod A, is the category of all right A models. No finiteness condition imposed. Then inj A is the category of all injective A models. By default, models are always right models. Then we have uh, DA. Is the unbounded derived category of the category of modules. Again, no finiteness conditions. And then, well, we, we don't really look at this category, we look at its canonical DG enhancement. So, its canonical DG 
enhancement, which you can construct, for example, as a Greenfield quotient. And that's the most intrinsic way of constructing it. So what does this mean? It means that it's a category whose objects are exactly the same as the objects of the derived category. So just complexes of right A modules and morphisms in this category are complexes. And the, these complexes compute morphisms in the derived category. Okay, and well, some, some remarks. So uh, if we compose these two isomorphisms, we see that uh, Hochschild cohomology of A coincides with Hochschild cohomology of the DG derived category. And this composed isomorphism should be viewed as an analog of the canonical isomorphism between the center of an algebra and the center of its module category. The isomorphism between Hochschild cohomology of a and Hochschild cohomology of the DG derived category of A, if you like, this is a derived version of the classical isomorphism between the center of A and the center of its module category. This Hochschild cohomology can be viewed as the derived version of the center and uh, the, de the derived category is the derived version of the model category. Okay, and in particular, we can apply this in degree zero We find that if we apply this in degree zero, we get the center of A is isomorphic to the center of the DG derived category, yes, which is defined as HH zero. Okay, and this is a desirable property. Yes, this preser preservation theory, because it is in in accordance with the classical fact that the center should coincide with the center of the model category. Now, if we look at the center of the derived category just as a K category, the endomorphisms of the identity functor, this is a pathological object. For example, one can compute that the center of the derived category Unfortunately, we have no. I will reconnect shortly. <laughs>
nice, nice to see you back. Uh, let me make you uh, co-host again. And I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, for some reason I I lost the connection. Let me share the screen again. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it now. Well. Okay, then uh, this is all for the first part. So now let me come to the main subject, Tate Hochschild chronology. And the statement of the main theorem. Okay, so now uh, we take a uh, right Ethereum ring. Again, for, for simplicity, everything can be done for arbitrary, uh, sorry, algebra. Everything can be done for arbitrary algebras. And then we have the category small mod A of all finitely generated right A models, which is a nice abelian category. We can form this bounded derived category. Um, which is yes, so of this abelian category of finitely generated A models. And inside the bounded derived category, we have the so-called perfect derived category. which is just the full subcategory of all complexes X, which are quasi-isomorphic to bounded complexes of finitely generated projective modules. Okay, now this is, uh, of course, a triangulated subcategory. So it's natural to look at the quotient. And well, this quotient, it, it will vanish uh, if the algebra is of finite global dimension, then the two categories coincide. If A is not, is of infinite global dimension, they will usually be different, it will usually be non-zero. And this quotient was first considered by Buchweiz in an unpublished manuscript in 1986. He called it the stable derived category in analogy with a stable module category where you just derive, divide by the projectives. And it was rediscovered by Dmitry Arlov in 2003 in a geometric context motivated by mirror symmetry. He called it the triangulated category of singularities. Nowadays, it's usually called simply the singularity category. And I will denote it by little sg of a. Okay, and now to define uh, tate hochschild cohomology, let's assume that the enveloping algebra is also an Ethereum. Okay, and then we define Tate Hochschild cohomology of 
also called singular offshot cohomology. And by definition, this is the Yoneda algebra of the identity bimodal in the singularity category of bimodals. Okay, now this is clearly an algebra and you can check directly that it is still a graded commutative algebra. Although the, the modern argument which we gave for classical Hochschild cohomology does not apply, the, the singularity category of bimodules is not a monoidal category in any natural way. Okay. But still, uh, it, it does resemble somehow uh, Dr. Eilenberg's formula for classical Hochschild cohomology. And you may ask whether it carries the same rich structure as classical Hochschild cohomology. Does it have a Gaston Hubble bracket? Is there a B infinity algebra whose homology is singular Hochschild cohomology? And these, these were questions which were open for quite a few years. Um, in particular, Buchweiz and his students attacked them in vain. And the solution was found by Zheng Fan Wang in his thesis under the supervision of Alexander Zimmermann. Namely, first of all, there is a canonical Gerson Harper bracket. Canonical, but very intricate. Kirsten Harbour Beckett. This he showed in 2015. And then more recently, he produced a B infinity algebra. Is a B infinity algebra as singular Hochschild cold chain complex, which computes singular Hochschild cohomology with its Gersten Harbour bracket. Okay, and then I should show you a picture of Gen 21. Yes, uh, so we see that there is a complete structural parallelism between classical Hochschild cohomology and uh, Tate Hochschild cohomology. And so we may ask whether Tate Hochschild cohomology is not an instance of classical Hochschild cohomology. Is it classical Hochschild cohomology of a slightly more complicated object than just an algebra? And the main theorem is that this is actually the case. Namely, uh, if the DG, the bounded DG derived category is smooth as a DG category, then we have a canonical isomorphism between Tate Hochschild cohomology and classical Hochschild cohomology of not an algebra but a DG category, namely the canonical DG enhancement of the singularity category. And this is an isomorphism of graded algebras. Okay, so now you see that we actually have two 
Gerson Haber brackets, yes, here we have the Gerson Haber bracket defined by Gerson Haber in 62. Here we have the Gerson Haber bracket defined by Zheng Fang Wang in 2015. And of course, we would like to know that this isomorphism of graded algebras preserves the Gerson Haber bracket. And moreover, uh, it should lift, hopefully, to the B infinity level. And uh, yes, I don't know how to prove that. So let me formulate it as a conjecture. This isomorphism. lifts to the B infinity level in analogy with the theorem of Leuven and Vandenberg. Okay, and there is one recent positive result in this direction due to Chen, Li, and the same Wang. Namely, this is true for so-called radical square zero algebras. So these are path algebras of finite quivers, where you divide by the square of the ideal generated by all the arrows. It's for Q a finite quiver uh, for technical reasons without sources and without sinks. Okay, so this is, uh, I guess, a typical example of such an algebra would be the algebra of dual numbers, which is associated with the quiver with just one vertex and one loop. Okay, this is, yes, so for these algebras, they, they check it directly by an explicit computation. They compute everything. They compute the DG singularity category and they compute explicitly co-chain models for everything and then they succeed in showing that it, it holds. Yes. And then I should uh, maybe recall what, what this hypothesis of smoothness means. Okay, so definition. A DG category A is smooth if the identity biomodel so if you like a viewed as a biomodel well this is given this is the dg functor taking a pair xy to just morphisms in a from x to y is a perfect object in the derived category of biomodels and uh, we may ask whether this is a restrictive assumption in, in the main theorem. Is it, does it often happen that this bounded derived category is smooth? Yes, well, we, we, one might think that one might need that A is smooth, but <laughs> that wouldn't be very interesting because then the singularity category vanishes. In fact, it is true uh, for, for, uh, for large classes of algebras A, they don't need to be smooth at all. Yes, this is a theorem by Lunds, Elagi, Lunds, and Chinero. From 2018, namely this bounded derived category smooth if the ground field is perfect and some finiteness hypothesis hold A is finitely generated as a module over its center and the center is a finitely generated K algebra. So for example, it always holds if A itself is a finite dimensional algebra over a field, yes, as 
For example, for these radical square zero algebras given by finite quivers, it, it always holds. Okay, and yes, maybe. Yes, so I, in, the, in the notes you will find the sketch of the construction of the isomorphism. Uh, the, in the main theorem, the isomorphism is constructed using a composition of a left derived functor with a right derived functor. And you know perhaps that if you compose a left with a right derived functor, the, the result is very hard to compute explicitly. And that's why uh, the conjecture is phenomenal trivial. So you will, you will find the, I will skip the construction um, and go directly to the applications. So the two reconstruction theorems. Okay, so the first theorem is for isolated hypersurface singularities. So let's take S, the whole series algebra over the complex numbers in n indeterminates and we take a quotient by a principal ideal and we assume that this quotient is an isolated singularity okay and then uh, the claim is that you can we reconstruct the singularity from the singularity category if you know the dimension. So R is determined by its dimension and the DG singularity category. And you, you do need the dimension because of Knorr periodicity. Yes, you, so Knorr periodicity gives you lots of examples where the singularities categories are the same, but the dimension differs by multiples of two. And let me sketch the proof. Okay, well, um, we are looking for a commutative algebra, so it's natural to look at the center of the DG singularity category, which is, of course, defined as zero Hochschild cohomology. Now, by the main theorem, yes, uh, and I should emphasize that this is joint work with one. So by the main theorem, this is also the zero Tate Hochschild homology of the algebra R. Okay, now uh, we have a hypersurface, and for a hypersurface, we can explicitly compute the DG singularity using matrix factorizations. And matrix factorizations by definition are two periodic, and therefore uh, these groups are also two periodic in, in the exponent. And so we get an isomorphism with Tate Hochschild cohomology in, say, high dimensions, high even dimensions. So here we use matrix factorizations to describe. The singular, the DG singularity category. Now, because 
R is a hypersurface, it's in particular Gorenstein, and therefore, by one of the results of Buchweiz from 86, its uh, singular Hochschild cohomology coincides with its usual Hochschild cohomology, its classical Hochschild cohomology in high degrees. Okay, so we are reduced to the computation of the Hochschild cohomology of the hypersurface in high degrees. Now, fortunately, this was done by the Buenos Aires Cyclic Homology Group in, at the beginning of the 90s in 92. And they showed that the result is the Turiner algebra of the singularity. And this, by definition, this is the quotient of the power series algebra by the ideal generated by the equation and all its partial derivatives. Bernard, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, here in this case, uh, which dimension you, when you say dimension uh, it's, of the singularity? It's, uh, it, it, it's n minus one. Yes. Ah, it's, it's just n minus A cruel, cruel dimension. It cruel dimension. Cruel, cruel dimension, but since it's a hypersurface, it's just n minus one, yes. And, uh, uh, and so somehow I got an, an, pardon? Uh, yes. uh, got an idea that you need infinite, infinite cohomological dimension, infinite global dimension, right? It's, it's a singularity, so it has infinite global dimension. Global dimension, so uh -huh. thank you. Uh, therefore, the singularity category itself is non-trivial. So it does contain some information, and it turns out that it contains enough information to reconstruct the singularity, to reconstruct the algebra R up to isomorphism if we know the dimension of the cruel dimension of this algebra. It's addition. kind of amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all the information is contained in the singularity category. Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, yeah, no, no, notice that the singularity category, well, it's, it's actually quite a nice category in this case because uh, we have an isolated singularity. So uh, morphism spaces in the homotopy category will be finite dimensional. It's a category with finite dimension morphism spaces and, and everything. Uh, yeah, okay, the, the DG singularity category so, so is, uh, has complexes whose homologies are finite dimensional. Okay, yes, and now, so, so we have computed that the center of the DG singularity category is nothing but the Turiner algebra. And uh, now it's a classical result from singularity theory that the dimension and the Turiner algebra together determine the singularity up to isomorphism. Yes, so this is a theorem which is due to Mada and Yao, not Xing Tung Yao, not the very famous Yao, but his brother, Steve Yao, in uh, 1982, if I remember correctly. So they, they did it in the uh, convergent series setup. We need it in the formal series setup. And here it is fortunately contained as a proposition in a paper by Coyle and Pham from 2017. They were mainly interested in positive characteristic, but kindly also included this result. And well, if, if you're familiar with the literature on Hochschild cohomology of singularities, you may be surprised because uh, you may remember that this computation, the computation of Hochschild cohomology of a hypersurface singularity, an isolated hypersurface singularity, is already in the literature. It was computed by Dickerhoff. In 2011. So not only is it in the literature, but the result, what's worse, the result is different. So he thought he, he, 
he computes that the center of the DG singularity category is not the Milner algebra, it's not the Turiner algebra, but the Milner algebra, which by definition is the power series algebra divided by the ideal generated only by the partial derivatives and not by the equation itself. Okay, so there seems to be a, a contradiction. And why is it not a contradiction? Well, uh, in our computation, we always consider this as a differential Z graded category. But Dickerhoff works with matrix factorization and considers the DG singularity category as a differential Z module two graded category. And this uh, subtle difference in viewpoint leads to these two completely different results. Okay, and I have maybe four minutes for the second application. It's to a more restricted uh, class of singularities with, which also have much more structure somehow more interesting perhaps than these general isolated hypersurface singularities. We take R, a complete local isolated uh, compound dual singularity. Okay, this means that it is three dimensional normal and if you take a section with the generic hyperplane through the origin then you get a Kleinian singularity so it's somehow a three-dimensional version of the uh, ADE surface singularities. And then we fix F uh, small Grappen resolution. So in particular, X is non singular. Okay, so the picture is as follows. We have spec R with an isolated singularity at the origin and we resolve it X. And then we have the exceptional fiber and the exceptional fiber is a tree of rational curves, curves isomorphic to P1. So this F contracts a tree of rational curves. And associated with this situation, there is the so-called contraction algebra. Introduced by Bill Donovan and Michael Weems in 2013. And the quickest, the quickest way to say what it is, is uh, it's an algebra which represents the deformations with non-commutative base of the exceptional fiber. There are several ways of defining it, but the quickest way is this one, represents the deformations with the non-commutative base of the exceptional fiber. And again, it's a, it's a finite dimensional algebra, remarkably. Finite dimensional non-commutative algebra, okay. 
And uh, it has been shown that this contraction algebra determines many invariants. of the singularity does work by, by Donovan Weems, by Toda, by Hua Toda, in particular it determines what are called the Gopakuma Wafa invariants. And since it determines so many invariants, uh, Donovan and Weems conjectured that it should be itself a complete invariant. So it should itself determine the singularity up to isomorphism, more precisely, even its derived equivalence class should be the singularity up to isomorphism. The derived equivalence class of the contraction algebra determines the singularity up to isomorphism. Okay, we, we cannot quite prove that, unfortunately, uh, but we can prove it if we add in some extra data. Namely, it turns out that this uh, contraction algebra is the Jacobian algebra of a quiver with potential. Yes, the potential is just a linear combination of cycles. And there's a canonical algebra associated with this statum, the quiver plus a linear combination of cycles. The Jacobian algebra, the fact that this holds is due to Tannhofer Tannhofer de Werksen. Not easy to remember. And Vandenberg from uh, 2010. And okay, so you, you can interpret the potential as an element in zero's Hochschild homology of the path algebra. And then the, the Jacobian algebra is a quotient of the path algebra. So we can take the image of the potential in zero's Hochschild homology of uh, the Jacobian algebra, so the contraction algebra. So in addition to the contraction algebra, we have this class, which is actually quite canonical. And then the second reconstruction theorem says that if we add in the information on this class, then we can reconstruct the singularity. So the derived equivalence class of the pair consisting of this finite dimensional algebra and this particular class determines the singularity up to isomorphism. So we, we add some evidence to Donovan Weems' conjecture. And now to, uh, yes, let me say two, two remarks, one, one quick remark on the proof. The proof is based on the first theorem. The first reconstruction theorem and a non-commutative Mather-Yau theorem. Instead of singularities, we look at quivers with potential, and there is a reconstruction theorem due to Hua and Kui Zhou from 2018. And then finally, the, there is a link to cluster theory, yes, because there has to be, because there are quivers with potentials. And it goes as follows. If you look at the singularity category of such a compound dual singularity, well, it turns out that it is a cluster category. It is the generalized cluster category of 
defined by Claire Agnew in 2009, associated with an arbitrary quiver with potential. Um, now, so the, this is very similar and the and these categories have uh, properties which are very similar to the properties of the cluster categories as they appear in additive categorification of cluster algebras. The only difference is that the quivers which appear are quite different. The quivers uh, appearing in Donovan Green's theory are very different. from those in cluster theory. So for example, a typical quiver in Domonovan Wien's theory would be like this. Yes, we have arrows going back and forth between vertices and you have loops. Okay, and by contrast, in, in cluster theory, you, you never have loops. You, you're not allowed to have loops, and you're not allowed to have two cycles because if you have that, then the combinatorics of the mutation depends on the potential and not just on the quiver. And so you lose an essential feature which uh, cluster theory needs to work. So here, a typical quiver from cluster theory. All the little squares are oriented so that we have four cycles. Okay, yes. Say we have k minus one rows and n minus k minus one columns, then this is the quiver which controls the classical cluster structure on the cone over the Grismanian. And so, well, as I, as I said here, you have lots of loops in two cycles here. You're not allowed to have any of them. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so questions? Uh, yes, Sarah. Yes. yes, so your applications you are talking about are to singularity theory, right? Mm -hmm. And this is mostly about commutative algebra. This is about right? commutative algebra, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, the so I wonder if one can do, yeah. do something in super case or an algebra not exactly commutative for super singularities. Ah, uh, yes, that, that's an interesting question. I. I don't know whether there's a theory of, yeah, singularity theory for supercommutative. I, I, I did something a like, long time ago, but mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. looks like a suitable tool. It seems like it is a suitable tool. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, so for yes. example, if you just take the Grassmann algebra, do you get anything interesting? I mean, uh, maybe something I think, trivial, but not exactly I, trivial. I, I think you must get something interesting, yes. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, so then, okay. <laughs> yeah, I have to go. I can stay longer okay. because I have another meeting. But thank you for the thank talk. You. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, more questions at this point? Uh, no more questions. Can I ask silly questions? So, uh, uh, <clears throat> when uh, you talked about the uh, conjecture that the isomorphism in the main theorem lifts to the B infinity level, so mm -hmm. each time when we when we say that it something lifts to B infinity level, do we actually imply that there is an isomorphism as k modules on the cochains? Or this is something more complicated. No, 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 no. <coughs> what we mean is that there's a zigzag of quasi-isomorphisms between okay. the two algebras. Yes. That's okay. Okay. 
Okay, good. Yeah, and that, that's what I also meant in Loven Vandenberg's theorem. Yes. Yes. Uh, and probably a follow up question. So if conjecture holds true, uh, would it imply any of the any of the subsequent theorem which which appeared in the in the applications? Mm, I don't I yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, we we haven't uh, been able to make use of the of the higher structure. So uh, with the present state of knowledge, no, no. Okay. Okay. okay uh, any more questions? At this this point. Okay. So let's let's thank Bernard for for an excellent talk. <laughs> That's. <laughs> 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 Yeah, thank you all very much for, for coming. <laughs> thank you once more for the invitation. Thank you. And see you at another seminar, maybe.